Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at one of the most iconic telescopes in our hobby's history, the Celestron C5 schmidt cassegrain Optical Tube Assembly. Now the C5 was originally built somewhere around the early 1970s as a lower cost alternative to this C8. And when you talk about products that have been around this long, I mean it's pretty hard to come up with something that's been around longer than this. Obviously the C8s outlive this, but other telescopes, you know the Questar maybe? This kind of longevity is very rare in our hobby. Now today, of course, these things are made overseas. They bear very little resemblance to the original C5s made in California, but still, there's been a continuous lineage from 1970 through today of these telescopes. And in that time, there have been many different variations. The first ones were orange tubed on a fork mount with a driven base. Perhaps the most contentious of the versions of the C5 are these white tubed versions from the 1990s. I've owned a couple of these and they varied widely. One of them wasn't very good at all. One of them was really good, but only after it had been collimated. When I first got that telescope, it was in the worst state of collimation that I had ever seen in any telescope. And in fact, it was so bad, I actually had trouble aligning it because when it's that far out, you kind of don't know where to start. But after we did get it collimated, boy was it good. So here's a couple of images from the moon before and after. Now keep in mind, 10 years or so when I did this review, we didn't have the quality of cameras that we do today. But you can tell the difference between the quality of the images before and after collimation. Wow, what a difference. Those white tube versions do have sentimental value among collectors because they were among the last of the California built Celestron C5s. Afterwards, the versions moved overseas. There have been a couple of different versions of those as well, including a black tube G5 version on a very inexpensive equatorial mount, the initial gray tubed Nexstar, and the current version, which is the Nexstar SE. This is characterized by what they call the triangle back on the visual back. So over the years, you know, the prices varied quite a bit on these. In the 1970s, it was around $500 when introduced, but in the early 1980s, which were hyperinflationary, which is when I got into the hobby, boy, did the cost of these things go up. Those of you in manufacturing know that when you build a smaller version of a product, it doesn't necessarily cost you any less to make it. Your fixed costs are the same. Your manufacturing costs are the same. Your labor costs are the same. It doesn't cost any less to advertise a C5 than it does a C8, but the consumer expects to pay less. And in the early 1980s, when inflation was very high, it almost threatened the very existence of the C5. And in fact, Meade had a 4-inch schmidt cassegrain that did not survive that era. But for whatever reason, the C5 did survive. So let's take a look at the C5 today and see how it performs. Okay, so here we have a C5 and you know, no matter how many times I do this, when I come to one of these after not having seen one for a while, I'm always amazed at how tight and compact this thing is. I think there's a tendency in our hobby to want to supersize everything. But you know, there's a place for a small, well-made, compact telescope, which this is. So we have Vixen compatible dovetail plate at the bottom for mounting, that's good. On the top here, we have provision for a finder. This is standard finder spacing. You can put a six by 30 optical finder on there if you want, but if you can, this one looks like it's been set up for a red dot finder. Got a couple of samples here, and these will just slide on like this, and you can use it like that. So we've got the mirror in the back, Secondary, we've got three collimation screws. That's good. Up to the back here. And this is the focuser. So those of you who have followed me through the years know that I have a pet peeve about these cheap stamp steel visual backs. They've got one set screw back here and everything that you are entrusting back after the visual back here is being held on by this tiny little set screw. And I, it's just trouble waiting to happen. I've seen things fall out. And they're cheaply made. Celestron is not the only one that does this. Mead does the same thing. They have a similar piece of stamp steel in the back. And even if you buy one of the larger Schmidt Cassegrains, it's, you still get this cheap visual back. I mean, come on, guys. You, you can do better than this. One of the first things I do when I get a Schmidt Cassegrain is I take this thing off, and I usually just toss it. But I will put on 
a two inch visual back and I've got a couple of samples here, one from Teleview and one from Astrophysics. People have their preferences here. These are not expensive. This is an easy upgrade to do. Uh, the Teleview has two big knobs here and a compression ring. The Astrophysics has three smaller knobs, but there are three of them and also a compression ring. And this just screws on like this. And even if you never use two inch accessories, you can put an inch and a quarter adapter in here. And I don't know if this is coming across on video, uh, but you know, this is way more physically secure than that little piece was that I just showed you. Okay, so people will sometimes ask me, what's the difference? Should I get a C5 or a C6? So we have the C5 here with its slightly larger brother. And you see there is an increase in size. I don't know how much this is coming across in video, but you've got about a five pound optical tube here. This one's about eight pounds and it may put you into a slightly larger mount. So going from the five to the six, you're looking at a weight increase of some 50% and a volume increase of some 70%. And all of that is on behalf of one inch. So is it worth it? A lot of things which are just starting to come perceptible in a C5 do start to become easier to see in the C6. There's plenty of reasons to buy each one of these. No correct answer, just buy the one that suits your needs. Okay, you know, if you talk to any C5 owner for any period of time, they're probably going to mention this. The C5 was selected by NASA to go up in space shuttle missions, and boy did Celestron get some good marketing mileage out of that one for a while. You know, based on how small and light and compact this thing is, there's going to be a temptation to want to put it on a photo tripod. And I see a lot of beginners doing this, and if you've done this before, you probably have figured out it doesn't work very well. It doesn't matter how sturdy the thing looks. Keep in mind, this has a 1250 millimeter focal length. So it's not the size and the weight that's going to do you in, it's the focal length. Think about it this way. If you're a photographer and you had a 1250 millimeter focal length lens, what kind of amount would you have to put underneath it? But it's even worse for astronomy because you're going to be magnifying that image. And not only does your mount have to hold the telescope steady, it has to be able to pan the thing smoothly across the sky to track the stars. And at 1250 millimeters, you are going to be pushing the mount around quite a bit. So you can try this, a lot of beginners do. Again, you figure out it doesn't work very well because again, the mount has to be steady and it has to be able to smoothly track. Those seem to be two contradictory things. So you really do need an astronomy specific mount. And we've got a few of them here. Let's take a look. So the first option you have is an alt as telescope mount like this Vixen Porta. You've seen this thing here before. I'm not sure this is available right now at the time of filming. They used to cost anywhere from three to $500. If you want one of these, you may be able to find one used, or there are similar models available from Explore Scientific, Orion, Stellarview has an M2, and there may be others as well. But this is pretty simple. You've got a Vixen compatible plate at the bottom, and you put the telescope on here like this, and you're good to go. And again, this looks like a photographic tripod, but it's actually much better. It's designed specifically for telescopes to track smoothly across the sky. Okay, so your second option is to put it on an electronic mount of some kind, either one that's got a passive tracking system or one with an active go-to system like this Nexstar mount. And if you like this configuration, they actually sell it in this package as the Nexstar 5SE, still available at the time of filming. You have the full benefits of tracking and a database of, I don't know how many thousands of objects. There's a lot of them in there. And your final option is to go with a traditional German equatorial mount like this Celestron AVX. They, the previous version of this mount was the CG5, and they still make the CG4 as of the time of filming. That's a smaller, lighter version of this one, and you can get away with that on a C5 and possibly even on a C6 as well. Again, this is similar to the Nexstar, except it's already on equatorial mode, and it can do astrophotography, and the computer has even more thousands of objects in it. And as for astrophotography, I mean, yeah, you could do it with a C5. In practice, very rarely do you see serious astro imaging done with a small Schmidt Cassegrain like this one, especially on deep sky. Every once in a while, you'll see somebody do it, but not so much. 
but for lunar and planetary imaging, you can have a lot of fun with this. And in fact, if you were going to get involved in astrophotography, this is the branch that I would suggest you get involved with as opposed to deep sky or nightscapes. All you need is a webcam planetary imager like this one. You put it in the focuser like this. Here is Clavius. Here is Gassendi. And here is Plato. And if you take enough of these, you can stitch them together and make lunar composites like this one. And not only that, some of the master imagers, the people who are the best in the world at this, just use simple webcam planetary imagers like this one and stock off the shelf Schmidt grains, although they usually use some of the larger ones. But as to you know, training yourself and getting started, a C5 is going to be just fine for you. Okay, and finally, I should probably address this. I'm getting a lot of questions lately about people wanting to buy 5-inch Maxitovs, asking me, is this a good first telescope? These 5-inch Max usually have the number 127 somewhere in the part number. When people ask me this, I usually tell them to get a C5 instead. Why is that? A couple of reasons. Well, first of all, you can collimate a schmidt cassegrain Most of those Max you know, they're not collimatable, so whatever alignment you get out of the factory, you're stuck with it. The second reason is the focal length on the C5 is shorter, 1250 millimeters versus 1500 millimeters plus. May not sound like a big difference, but with the shorter focal length, it's going to yield lower magnifications, which are going to make things easier to find and putting less stress on the mount to hold the telescope steady. So I'm not saying don't buy the Mac. I'm just telling you, take a look at the C5 first before you spend your money. Okay, so just to show you how small, how diminutive the C5 is, here it is in comparison with most of the other currently available Celestron schmidt cassegrains Got the C5 on the floor here by my foot. Got a C6 here on an X-Star. We have a C8 slightly modified there with an external Crayford focuser. We have two C9 and a quarters, the base model here, the edge here, and we have a C11 right in front of me. Only model I'm missing right now is a C14. Okay, so don't undermount the scope. I would replace the visual back if I could. Other than that, complaints about these are pretty minor. One little complaint you'll hear about this is that the dust cap has a tendency to fall off. The C6 also does this. And that may seem like a little thing, but if you look, this one is already missing. I have no idea where the dust cap is. And if you look back at the astronaut picture on the shuttle, even they knew to duct tape the cap to the scope. So other than that, these are usually pretty bulletproof. As long as the scope hasn't been abused in some way, you can buy these used, and they tend to be good buys. So hopefully this has given you some information to determine if this scope is right for you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.